Hey, I'm Steve Leto, and today is Christmas Eve, and every Christmas Eve I'm reminded of the Italian Hall disaster. I've spoken about that before. I've written a couple books and things about the Italian Hall disaster, but I think it's important that on Christmas Eve that you take just a moment and remember what happened. And um, in 1913, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, there's a miners' strike in the copper industry. Uh, the very, very tip of the Cunard Peninsula, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, there's a sp- place called the Copper Country. And it's because they mine copper up there. They used to, at least, for many, many years. And uh, copper, uh, you know, is used in a lot of things, including our coins. And um, the largest producers of copper in the world between about 1880 and 1920 were in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And the copper mines uh, shut down later, but in the run that time period, uh, extremely important stuff. So in 1913... The uh, miners uh, unionized and went on strike, the Western Federation of Miners. And one of the primary reasons they went on strike was that the working conditions were brutal. Uh, Miners made anywhere from four or five bucks a day, but many of them got maimed or killed in the mines. In fact, in 1912, 1913, on average, about one man would die per week in the mines. Extremely difficult labor. So uh, they unionized, they went on strike, and the strike started in 1913. It was dragging on all summer, all fall, and there was no sign of, uh, of the strike coming to an end so that as uh, Christmas approached, the people who ran the union and some of the people who were affiliated with the union said, hey, why don't we at least throw a party for the children of the striking miners? And so they decided to hold a party on Christmas Eve in a place called the Italian Hall. And um, I'll, I'm going to post some photographs up on the screen as I'm talking here. But the Italian Hall was a two-story building in downtown Calumet, which at the time, by the way, was called Red Jacket. It's called Calumet today, but at the time, the, the village was actually known as Red Jacket. And the lower half of the building had a grocery store and a bar, Viro's Saloon and an a and grocery store. And then on the upper floor was a meeting hall uh, where there was uh, the, we're going to hold a party and a stage and all that. And so people would go up the stairs on the left-hand side of the building, steep flight of stairs into the top, they'd enter in the main hall where all the entertainment was. And this is in the late afternoon on Christmas Eve in 1913. And so um, there were probably five or 600 people who showed up to come to this party. And it was an overwhelmingly large uh, group of children in the population of the people who were in the building at the time. There were actually probably seven or eight children for each adult. Many uh, parents brought their kids plus their neighbor's kids and so on. And many of the uh, families were non-English speaking people. A lot of Finnish people, a lot of Croatians, a lot of Italians, Hungarians and so on. Because many of the people who worked in the mines, especially in the lower levels of the mines doing the hardest labor, uh, didn't speak English. Uh, it was very, very well known that if you came to America and could not speak English, you could still get a job in the mines as long as you're willing to put in a lot of hard work under dangerous conditions. So uh, the party was held in the Italian Hall. But the weird thing is that prior to the Italian Hall disaster on Christmas Eve, there was a lot of conflicts between the union and uh, the mine, mine management, the people who ran the mines. And in fact, the mine managers had actually brought in strike breakers, which is a profession we don't have today. But you could actually hire people who would come in from out of town and were willing to do the work that the locals wouldn't do, so to speak, uh, by basically being thugs, beating up strikers. Uh, Whenever the strikers were picketing, they'd go bust up the pickets and so on. And so you'd have this kind of violence. And there was a lot of violence in the time preceding the Italian Hall disaster itself. So there's a group of people uh, along with the strike breakers, a group of people called the Citizens Alliance. And the Citizens Alliance was a sham organization set up by mine management. Uh, and, and these people would wear these pins, the Citizens Alliance, and they'd ask people to sign petitions uh, denouncing the Western Federation of Miners. And the Citizens Alliance uh, pledged that they would do everything they could to drive the, the union out of the copper country. And they would actually tell people to wear the white pin with red letters on it that said Citizens Alliance to let people know that you were anti-union, you were pro-business. So the little Citizens Alliance pins actually looked just like this because this is a real one. Um, And so people would wear these pins to indicate that they were anti-union and pro-business. So uh, early afternoon, as the people started arriving at the Italian Hall, they'd go up the stairs into the main meeting hall and a large crowd eventually formed up there. And uh, sometime around while the children are going across the stage to get their presents from Santa Claus, a man came in from the outside 
and yelled as loud as he could in the English language. The words fire, he yelled fire very, very loudly and it caused a panic. And the word fire got repeated through the crowd. Some people translated it into their own languages, uh, but people immediately panicked and headed towards the doors. And the way to get out of the Italian hall, if you're on the top floor of there, is the most logical thing would be go out the doors you came in at the, at the top of the stairs. You go through those doors and there's a very, very hard left turn to go down the staircase. And the staircase is very, very steep. And the, the rise between the top of the staircase and the bottom of the staircase was 14 feet. And by modern building codes, you could not have a single flight of stairs for 14 feet. You'd actually have to break that in half and put a landing in the middle because most rises are supposed to be 12 feet or less. So at the time, though, that was considered okay. And what happened was, uh, as people were rushing through those doors and making the hard left turn down the stairs, somebody tripped and fell. And as people were pushing from behind, and there's all these little kids in the crowd, people started piling up in the staircase, and they and they couldn't stop people from coming in and pushing down the stairs. There was no fire. There was no fire. But people piled up in the stairs, and eventually, um, 73 people died in that pileup, 60 of whom were children. And at the bottom of the stairs were two sets of doors that both opened outward. And for some strange reason, rumors started that the doors opened the wrong way. But those rumors actually didn't start till much, much later. The first people who arrived on the scene to try to help were the volunteer fire department, the Red Jacket Fire Department. The fire department headquarters was just about a block away and somebody called in an alarm. And so they showed up very, very quickly. And when they got there, they could open the doors up at the bottom of the stairs, but they could not get the people out from underneath because of the weight of the people pushing down from above. So they went around the side of the building. There's a fire escape up the side of the building, went inside, found the top of the stairs, and started pulling people off the top very, very quickly. I mean, this whole thing was over in a matter of minutes. Uh, they started laying people down, and some of the people they laid down were unconscious and revived and were fine. Other people they laid down that they thought were alive were dead. And so of the People they pulled out of there, 73, at least 73 died. It's possible there were more who died, but we don't we don't know exact numbers, but 73 is a minimum. And um, the crazy part about all this is, is that people saw the man who cried fire. There were witnesses who said, yeah, I saw him, I'd recognize him again. And in fact, he was wearing a Citizens Alliance pin. Now, the thing about this is, is that when 73 people die and it's obvious there was no fire, most people think immediately, okay, call law enforcement. Well, the problem is that law enforcement was in the hip pocket of the mines, and the law enforcement did a very, very shabby job of, of, of looking into this. And in fact, uh, when the local newspapers ran stories about what happened, the most local newspapers, the ones right in Calumet and nearby uh, Houghton and Hancock, published stories about how it's a disaster we'll never be able to figure out. And they declared that within 24 hours. We'll never be able to figure out what happened here. But the local Finnish newspaper, Tuomis, which was a uh, radical uh, Finnish newspaper, was very, very pro-worker, anti-management, ran a headline that translated into English as 83 murdered. And in response to that newspaper article, the local sheriff went to the headquarters of the newspaper and rounded up all the editors and I believe even a bookkeeper and arrested them and threw them in jail. So the only arrests that arose out of the Italian Hall disaster were the arrests of the local newspaper men who were trying to report on the story. And they were simply publishing stories that they had heard, that the reporters had heard, that a man had come in from outside and had yelled fire, and that they thought he was a strike breaker. And in fact, many people said that they recognized him and he's a strike breaker. So the idea that we could never figure this out, um, that popped up almost immediately, but it was simply not true. They could have figured it out if they wanted to. So the weird thing is that they did hold an inquest because under law at the time in Michigan, if somebody died in a violent manner, the uh, law required that there be an inquest by the coroner to determine the cause of death. Uh, the inquest doesn't need to be full-blown necessarily, but here they said, well, 73 people died. We'll hold an inquest over the 73 bodies. And they held an inquest for three days. And um, we have the transcript of the hearing. And uh, it was the most amazing thing because they called in people who didn't speak English and forced them to answer questions in English with no translators. Um, and we know this because one person actually did testify through a translator who just happened to be their next door neighbor who spoke their language. And all the other people did not get to use translators. Uh, they also called people who weren't there to ask them what they knew. They didn't call people who were there, some of whom who were there were not called. 
And it was obvious they were not trying to get to the bottom of this. And in fact, the man who was the coroner at the time had no medical training. And it's ironic because he used to be a justice of the peace. He had no legal training either. But he was known as being a very good friend of mine management. So after three days, uh, he filled out 73 death certificates and left blank the cause of death, other than to say that the people died as a result of a false cry of fire. So they did draw the conclusion that there was indeed a false cry of fire, but couldn't pin the blame on anybody. And when it came to listing whether the cause of death was accidental, homicidal, or suicidal, he left it blank. Left it blank. Did not specify. So it's, it's, it's kind of strange, but that's, that's what the man did. So uh, the 73 victims were buried at the Lakeview Cemetery, a couple miles outside of town. And um, this all happened just a few days after the disaster. Uh, so many people have died in such a short period of time that the local funeral homes were overwhelmed. Uh, and so they actually had to hold um, mass funerals. There's some famous photographs, uh, Pine Street Apostolic Lutheran Church on Pine Street, uh, where there's at least a dozen coffins laid out around the altar. Um, and they had to put out a call to the local communities nearby and say, does anybody have any children's coffins? We don't have enough children's coffins in town to handle all the dead. So the 73 who died, 60 were children, and more than half of those were Finnish children. So in the Finnish community where I'm from, the uh, Italian Hall disaster is, I tell people, it's our Titanic. It's, it's the big tragedy that we're all aware of. Even in Finland, they know about the Italian Hall disaster in America. Uh, and a lot of people assume, because of the name of the Italian Hall, they assume it has to do with the Italians. And there were Italians there. But the vast majority of the victims were Finns because the Finns made up such a large portion of the uh, striking miners at that time. So 73 people were, were uh, buried at the Lakeview uh, Cemetery. And at Graveside, there were some speakers. And uh, they had, you know, of course, um, services in a variety of different languages. And one of the speakers um, said, you know, we don't want charity. We want justice. Uh, because after the disaster had happened, the mines had gone out and, and very publicly said, oh, we'll give money to the victims' families. You know, if anybody needs help burying their dead, you know, we'll help you. And they actually went door to door and tried to give away their money. And, and the victims' families wouldn't take it. And there's some famous stories of where uh, people had gone door to door trying to give away charity, being chased out of the house. You know, you killed our kids. We're not going to take your money. You know, so um, uh, there were obviously very, very harsh feelings at that time. And to this day, there still are. Uh, if you go to Calumet today, you can still find people who get very fired up talking about this, not just people like me who've written books about it. So um, as people who've watched my channel know, uh, I mention it from time to time because behind me, I have a block of wood from the Italian Hall. Um, the Italian Hall got knocked down in 1984. And some enterprising local got some of the wood from the floorboards and had these made as paperweights, wood from the Italian Hall with the dates of the building. It went up in 1908 and got knocked down in 1984. But Christmas Eve 1913 is the date of the event, and so it's on the block of wood, which is always behind me. And next to me today, I brought it back out on the set, is a chair from the Italian Hall. So in the photograph I put up earlier of the interior of the hall the morning after the disaster, this is one of the chairs in that photograph. And it is a chair that I don't sit in. I just have it here uh, as a reminder. But this was, you know, there on the night of the Italian Hall disaster. And then likewise, I also have in my possession a member's ribbon. And I'm assuming this is from slightly later time, but it is uh, for the um, members of the Italian Hall. The Italian Hall is a, a, a you know, a society that ran it and originally was simply a meeting place for the Italians and their uh, local clubs, but other groups used it. But, but so that's, that's um, the ribbon they would wear. And then when they marched in a parade, they'd flip the ribbon over and wear it with the black side out. So I had this framed in such a way that I can see both sides and show it to people. But that is, of course, that's a, a ceremonial ribbon uh, from the members of the Italian Hall. But the Italian Hall disaster... Um, made national headlines, or, you know, it was actually made international headlines. I've, I've seen headlines from Australia about the Italian Hall, but that was a few days later. It took that long for the story to travel down there. Front page of the Detroit News, 
front page of the New York Times above the fold on Christmas morning, 1913. Um, and the story was widely circulated. People knew about it. But but because no one was ever arrested for it, um, it kind of dropped off the radar. The strike ended in April of 1914. Many of the workers went back to work in the mines. Many of the workers actually left the area and came down to Detroit to work in the in the plants. Uh, Henry Ford announced a $5 a day work day right around the same time. So many of them decided, hey, it's better to go work in Detroit for five bucks a day above ground than four bucks a day underground where I could get crushed by rock tomorrow. And the local headline would be a little tiny thing that just says, you know, another Finlander dies in the mine, which was a common thing you'd see back in the day. So the building, like I said, got torn down in 1984. Uh, a couple other things have happened of note. Um, Woody Guthrie wrote a song called 1913 Massacre about the event, um, and uh, it's been performed by other people. Uh, Arlo Guthrie performs it sometimes uh, when he performs uh, live. And likewise, um, he also often does show up in Calumet and perform at the Calumet Theater and often performs a song there. Calumet Theater, ironically, is attached to the same building as the fire department and the village hall. And the inquest, most of the inquest took place in the village hall attached to that building. It's all one big structure. And uh, the temporary morgue where most of the victims were laid out to be identified is attached to that building also. So it's it's a wild story. Um, I wrote a book called Death's Door, and they made a documentary called Red Metal that I'm also in about the Italian Hall disaster. Um, but on the back of my copy, I've got This Machine Kills Fascists because that, of course, is a saying that uh, Woody Guthrie had uh, on his guitar that he would accompany himself with when he performed his songs, including the song 1913 Massacre. So the 100th anniversary was in 2013. Here we are, you know, a few years after that. And it's a big event um, that I, I think it's important that people remember it, uh, not just because it's a historical event where people died. You know, people are always intrigued by tragedies, you know, boats sink, airplanes crash. Buildings collapse uh, and people die. And, 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 and as humans, we're always intrigued by these things. But it also happened during the midst of a labor strike. It's a labor story. And, you know, nowadays, you know, people have mixed feelings about unions, but we forget what it was like before the unions existed in the first place. And, you know, these guys were working under conditions where you could die. And if you died, they would literally come to your house to notify your widow and also give her the eviction notice because... She had to get out of that house so they could give the house to somebody else who was working because your husband ain't working anymore. He's dead. So times have changed. Uh, I'm not trying to get in a soapbox here, but it was a labor event. Uh, it was a tragedy. Uh, it was international headlines. Uh, but it's also something that I think is, is also deeply memorable because it happened on Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve. And, and you think about this. A children's party, a Christmas Eve children's party. And at the height of the party, with Santa Claus on stage, handing out gifts to children, and families gathering, trying to forget how difficult life is at that moment in time because of the troubles that are happening in the adult world at a children's party. An adult runs into it and yells fire just to cause a commotion and causes 73 people to die. And I had subtitled the first edition of my book, Michigan's Largest Mass Murder. I had gotten a lot of grief from people who said, Steve, that's not murder. And I said, well, yeah, actually it is. It is. It's a homicide. And it's a homicide when somebody kills another person. And if I do something that's reckless, dangerous, careless, whatever you want to call it, I don't think the man who cried fire meant to kill people. But he certainly did something that was so reckless as he did it with a disregard for human life. And 73 people did die. And I think that most people, given those facts, that a man went into a children's party on Christmas Eve and yelled fire to cause a panic, a panic was caused and 73 people died as a result. Most people would say, yeah, that makes sense, that, that, that these facts would flow like that. And therefore, the guy who yelled fire shouldn't have done it. That's the important thing. He shouldn't have done it, and he did. That's a crime. So 
you know, the guy was never apprehended. He wasn't prosecuted. That's sad. I think we know who he was. I think he was a strike breaker. I think he could have been identified. I think he could have been arrested. I think they actually got him out of the area to protect him because if they busted him, if he said, yeah, by the way, I was told to go in there and break up that party, that would have made other people look bad. So that's how things happened back then in 1913. If you go to Calumet today, it's not hard to find the Italian Hall site. Drive around a little bit, you'll find it on your own, but it's on maps. A couple blocks off of Main Street, and all they have left there today is the arch, just the arch. They, they knocked the building down, but they saved the arch. And there's a park there. They saved the piece of property. And there's now a spot where you can sit down and, and pause and reflect. And there's a historical marker on the site. And a few years ago, they changed it. The original marker had actually said that the doors opened the wrong way. And the doors did not open the wrong way. And you might say, Steve, why do you care so much about that? I personally think that people liked to blame the doors because the doors are an inanimate object. And if it's the door's fault, then you can't blame a person. But if the doors open the correct way, which they did, then it's obviously the fault of the man who cried fire. So don't forget there was a bad man at the middle of all this, and he should not be forgotten. Uh, he shouldn't be celebrated, but he shouldn't be forgotten. So we remember history so we don't repeat it. We can learn lessons from history. Uh, and 73 people perished. They should not be forgotten. And, uh, you know, it's Christmas Eve. Tomorrow will be Christmas, and I like to think about the Italian Hall disaster for a little bit of time on every Christmas Eve, and I would ask that you do the same. So there you go. The Italian Hall disaster, Christmas Eve 1913, and I hope you learned something today, and I thank you for listening. Bye-bye.